Welcome to the Sniff Spotlight series, your one-stop shop to find out what's really going on in Sniffs nationwide. I'm your host, Yitz Rubin, and this is sponsored by Renewal Rehab, the best therapy provider for Sniffs nationwide. First of all, Rina, thank you so much for coming on to the, the Sniff Spotlight. You've been living in Israel originally from, for the past 20 years, originally from Baltimore, Maryland. You're a geriatric social worker and a memory coach. So how did you get involved in this line of work? So when I was a teenager, all my friends went to camp in the summer and I went to the nursing home to volunteer. So I would do activities with the elderly people in the nursing homes and I loved it. And I realized that this is my calling in life. I was really passionate about it. So when I had to go to college for a degree, I didn't know what degree to go for. My only interest was working with seniors or elderly. So I went for a degree in that. And I specialized in clinical aging, which is what we called it then. And then my first job out of graduate school was I was the head of an Alzheimer's unit in an assisted living facility near Baltimore. It was Columbia, actually, Columbia, Maryland. I was the head of that unit. That was an amazing job. I really, really learned a lot about a lot of things in the field. But that was like my first real job. And then I, I actually moved to Israel. And over the past 20 years in Israel, I've been doing a lot of different things in the field, interesting and varied things in the field of gerontology, geriatrics, working with seniors. I've worked with people with dementia. I've worked with healthy seniors and active seniors. So I have a lot of interesting experience, but I was always fascinated by memory, like what makes memory work and what makes it not work. So I did a lot of research. I took a course on... Many years ago, I took a course on memory from a cognitive psychologist here in Israel, in Hebrew, and that was challenging. <laughs> it was amazing, and I decided I wanted to teach that type of thing in English. So I read all the books and spoke to the doctors and listened to the webinars and did tons of research, and I put together my own course in English. Slowly, it was like a process over years, and I was teaching that locally here in Israel all over. I've taught in at least four cities many times, the whole course, the memory improvement course. And then I wanted to go online with it. I figured I can reach seniors all over the world. I don't have to just be you know, limited to Israel. So I started putting it online before COVID. And when COVID hit, I was just, like I was telling you before, in the right place at the right time because all the seniors were on Zoom and all the senior programs around the world needed interesting virtual programs. And memory is a hot topic. <laughs> First of all, is this something that's more prone to someone who has Alzheimer's in his family or dementia in the family? Is it hereditary? Okay, so genetics is one little piece of the puzzle. If you would have asked me this question 20 or 25 years ago, the research said, oh gosh, genetics is it and you're in trouble. But now there's much more research and we believe that, let's say you have you know, 100%, so less than a third, so less than 30% is going to be attributed to genetics, which means that you, there's so much you can do to prevent dementia. So even if you have a gene, you can eat properly and sleep properly and exercise properly and education. And I have a whole list of things, um, socialization, and you do all the right things. No one could promise you anything, but you have a much better chance of beating those genes. In fact, some doctors say that it's only 10% of the cases are genetic, meaning 90% of the Alzheimer's cases are not genetic. So those are like much newer statistics than what we used to say. And it's good news and it's hopeful and it's empowering because the fear of dementia is very, very great, especially among the caregivers of the people, you know, with dementia. So that's also part of my audience is really helping people through the fear of dementia by empowering them with tools, techniques, and tips and explaining to people that you really do not have to end up with dementia. There's a lot you can do. So many of the risk factors are preventable. So what can someone do to stay healthy cognitively? and to okay. reverse dementia. And, and is this also in regards to, to Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is one type of dementia. There's many types of dementias, right? Alzheimer's is one type. So we tend to use Alzheimer's and dementia interchangeably, right? But just to explain, Alzheimer's is one type of dementia. So what can we do to stay healthier and try to prevent it? I, I like to break it up into three major categories, which are the physical stimulation, cognitive stimulation, and physical cognitive, and then the other things, the social and the hobbies and education and other stuff. So if we're talking about the physical, we're talking about exercise and diet, which there is so much research on. Think of it like this. When you exercise physically, it's like pouring water on a plant. The plant grows. When you exercise, it's pouring water on, like, it's like pouring water on your brain. What's going to happen? Your brain is going to grow. 
You literally grow new brain cells when you exercise. Even for people that are old and they say they can't exercise because this hurts them and that hurts them, never too late, start exercising no matter how old you are. If you need a personal trainer, find a personal trainer, find whatever you need to start exercising at any point. So that's physical exercise. And then the diet piece, again, each of these things I could talk about for a whole webinar, but I'm doing it quickly. So the diet piece also, there's just so many foods that we could be eating that are good for our brain, the healthy fats, the avocados, the fish, the nuts, the olive oil, it's just things that are good for our brain. And then getting rid of all the sugar and white flour and processed foods that we're used to eating and all the junk food. I'm um, just really, really not good for our brain. There's a lot of research on this these days. And then the, the cognitive part, the cognitive stimulation, which is what I do, which is first of all, believing in your memory, having the confidence that I can do this. I can improve my memory because you can, whether you believe you can, or you believe you can't, you're right. So you might as well believe you can. <laughs> And I give people like the tips, techniques, and tools to really improve their memory. And they're easy. They're not hard stuff. I only teach techniques that I can do myself. So I don't teach anything that fancy. <laughs> and it's very geared for like seniors. I'm my audience is seniors. I'm talking to seniors. I want to help seniors age more gracefully and healthfully, cognitively. So it's brain exercises and it's staying sharp. So it's use it or lose it. Like we always say, use it or lose it. And then the third piece is the socialization which we are socially starved. I don't know what it's like in Chicago, but this past year, we are all socially starved. And the social isolation has taken a terrible toll on people's mental health, especially the seniors who have been really, really locked in. Thank God here in Israel, things have really opened up. I just went to several in-person meetings this week. Yay, so exciting. Thank God. Um, nothing like in-person, nothing like live connection. People need connection. So when we're talking about aging and socialization, the research shows that people that stay socially connected live longer. It's not so surprising, but yet we underestimate. We underestimate the value of being with people. That's a little bit on, on one foot, what you could do to age more healthfully and stay sharper longer. What are the different types of dementia? So Alzheimer's is the most common. That's what we hear about the most and we see the most. Then there's vascular dementia, which comes from like strokes. People that have had either mini strokes or big strokes. So different parts of the brain get damaged. But there's rehab. Like with everything in this day and age, we just really believe in the brain's capacity to regenerate, rejuvenate, revive. So through the proper cognitive stimulation, we can help bring back some of the damage or repair some of the damaged cells in the brain from stroke, so there's vascular dementia. And then there's, there's some other ones, Parkinson's. There's some other ones that are rarer that people don't know about as, as much, such as frontal temporal dementia, which is really hard. That affects personality. And sometimes that hits people much earlier on. And that's very sad to watch. Again, there's a lot of things that just can help people stay sharper longer, even if we can't cure it. There's something also called Jacob Kutzfeld dementia, not as well known, different types of dementia. But Alzheimer's is the one that we hear about and affects the most people and it's the most common. So what are some of the biggest challenges you see in patients dealing with memory loss? And are there separate challenges for the different types of dementia typically? I do always ask what type of dementia it is. But the truth is, is that what do I want to do? I want to help people have better quality of life. I want to help them improve their memory. So yes, if they've had an Alzheimer's diagnosis for 10 years, I'm going to work a little differently with them than if they like are pre-dementia, right? And with mild cognitive impairment. So I, I, I do memory. I also do one-on-one -on -one memory coaching and memory assessment. So I can't tell which dementia it is usually, unless it's like very, very obvious, but usually they come to me with a diagnosis and then I'll make a custom plan. But really what I've been working with more is the younger group, like the midlifers and seniors, let's say the fifties and 60 year olds who are just starting with some memory loss and they're worried, they're really scared that this is dementia. So most of the time I'm able to calm them down and prove to them that it's not dementia, at least not yet. Like I tell them, I can't promise what's gonna be 10 years down the line in your brain. But right now, you know, I do a memory assessment and usually I can prove to people that they're not totally losing it, which is what they need to hear. And then they're empowered to say, okay, so what should I do about it? And then I say, let's learn some techniques. Let's do brain exercises to keep sharp. And then I go and I, I help them do that either as a group or individually. So you're not really on the diagnostic side. Like, is there like a physical diagnosis? Usually the neurologists have to scan the brain to really figure out what's going on. So that's why I leave that to the doctors, the neurologists. You know, some people will say it doesn't really matter. Let's just 
treat the symptoms. So if the symptoms are behavioral, let's deal with that. If the symptoms are physical, let's just deal with everything that comes up. What does it really matter? And other doctors say, no, let's do CAT scans. Let's do spec scans. Let's do PET. Let's try to figure out exactly what it is. Some doctors want to give medicine, even though everyone knows the medicines don't work, but that's all they have. There is a doctor by the name of Dr. Dale Bredesen. His book is called The End to Alzheimer's. And he is doing a protocol that is very different. He's a functional medicine doctor. It's a functional medicine approach. It's a much broader approach. He looks at like a lot of different factors. And he is one of the few doctors that is actually reversing dementia. So um, in terms of the medical piece, we are becoming more creative and progressive, even with dementia. <laughs> so a senior that's already been diagnosed, how okay. would they cope with this memory loss? So again, it depends at what point they're at. Like if a person, if the brain is so decayed that they cannot learn anything new, which people do get to further on. So it really depends where they're at. But let's assume that the beginning, the beginning, you want to hold on to whatever there is there, right? So you want to stay sharp. You want to keep cognitively active, socially stimulated, physically active. The same thing, you want to keep at it. They say that people that have dementia, that exercise is really still very good for them. It's not like, oh, you have dementia, don't exercise. People with dementia need to exercise. It's good for them. It's good for their brains, besides for their bodies, obviously. It's use it or lose it. So you want to, even with the diagnosis, the more stimulated you are, the less likely your brain is going to decay faster. Cognitive reserve is that if you are very educated and you keep very stimulated, you can almost like, it's a buffer. It's a buffer to aging and to the to all the things, the diseases that come along with it. And that also explains why when people retire, and they stop doing a lot of meaningful activities, they deteriorate. And we see this all the time. Again, there's no promises or guarantees. I think we all know great rabbis that learned a lot and ended up with Alzheimer's. So there are no promises or guarantees, but for sure, they are using that brain. They are stimulated. And, you know, we don't know, we can't prove this, but let's say those people that at, let's say 98 had dementia, if not for all that learning, maybe at 75, they would have, you know, manifested those symptoms. Learning anything really is, super stimulating and learning something new. The idea is you want to be making new connections in the brain. It doesn't even matter if you speak the language, just learn a new language, learn to play a new instrument because music also is very, very good for the brain. And I say, now's the time, you know, now you have time, you have energy. You could go online and learn almost anything for free. It's called neurogenesis. I'm sure we, you, you all heard that word. Neurogenesis means creating new brain cells. There's different brain games that, and different games that are good for different parts of the brain. So part of the brain that's in charge of coordination, you want to be doing coordination exercises to work that part. But the part that's in charge of like thinking and planning and like the prefrontal cortex, you want to do other games for that. And the part that's in charge of words, you want to be doing the word games and the verbal stuff. This is fascinating. So do you have <laughs> different strategies yet yeah, to help with cognitive loss versus physical struggles? It really depends on what part of the brain is damaged, if we know that. So for example, with stroke, but so like with Parkinson's, it's harder. It sort of depends on what they're complaining about, like which issues they're complaining about. Let's say with stroke, also people complain about a lot of speech. So we can work on part of the brain that has to do with speech. The part of the brain that's in charge of word we call, it's called the left insula, it shrinks. And what helps it grow is exercise, even just walking. They said, they even said, if you just go walking, it can help grow that part of the brain that shrinks. So just going back to your question, depending what the issue is, so it's not always related to exactly what disease they have. It's sort of, I, I hear, okay, what are you complaining about? And then what can we do with that complaint? Whether it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or vascular dementia, tell me what the issues are. Is it word recall? Is it thought patterns? Is it short-term memory? A lot of people complain, I, I, don't, I can't remember if I ate breakfast or not. So it depends what the symptoms are, what the complaints are and the concerns, and then I'll take it from there. And I'm happy to share one or two techniques right here if you want. Go for it. This is focus. A lot of us, if we're talking about people in their 50s and 60s, we blame our memory. We say, oh, I can't remember where I put my keys. It's not that you can't remember where you put your keys. You didn't pay attention to it in the first place. Your hand dropped your key somewhere. Your brain was in Honolulu. Or thinking about what you're making for supper or who you have to call or what bill you have to pay. If we don't engage the brain, there's no memory being made or lost because it didn't happen. We didn't even encode the memory. So what I try to impress on people is before you tell me you forgot where your keys are, I want to ask you, did you even make the memory? Did you even encode the memory properly? And the answer is usually no. That alone is a very freeing and liberating thought because, oh, it's not my memory. If I just pay attention to what I'm doing, I can remember this. 
So how are we going to do that? You go to the fridge, you open the fridge, and you can't remember where you came from. But now you can't remember. You were internally distracted by your thoughts from when you had the thought, I need the milk from the fridge to when you got to the fridge, right? Basically, very simple, silly solution is I need the milk from the fridge. Milk, 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 till I get to the fridge. It's allowing, it's not allowing myself to get distracted. It's just staying focused on one task at a time. Stop multitasking is the first thing I tell people. Multitasking is actually, it trips up our brain. It stresses us out. It makes us less creative. It even lowers our IQ temporarily by 15 points. So I hope that's enough reason to stop multitasking. And when we stop multitasking, then you're focusing on one task at a time. You're finishing the task. You're actually accomplishing something. Then you can actually remember what the next thing is that you have to do. Instead of trying to go, you know, jump from thing to thing, which we all do. As we get older, it gets more difficult to pay attention to more than one thing at a time. And the next thing that I love to do, again, we'll use the example of you're trying to find your keys, your cell phone, your glasses, is giving it that attention and intention. It's like, I want to remember where I put my keys. For two seconds, I'm going to actually watch my hands, drop the keys down. I'm going to hear the clink of the keys on the table. And I'm going to say out loud, I put my keys on the coffee table. Now that takes two seconds to do. And in an hour, two hours, when I go, where are my keys? Oh, I know. I saw my hand drop them, I heard them click, and I said out loud, I'm putting them on the coffee table. So just by that, making the intention to remember, giving it two seconds of attention and talking out loud really helps you encode that memory into long-term memory so it's there when you want to retrieve it. In your career, you've been working with people as far as memory care is concerned, memory care both in the States and internationally. How is that handled? Is, Is memory care handled differently in other countries than in the States? So I could tell you about one very special program I know about in actually Holland. And it's very much the idea of reminiscence. When I worked in the assisted living facility, I was called the reminiscence director. It was a locked 25 bed unit of Alzheimer's care. It was really about reminiscence. It was about making, making the residents feel very comfortable, bringing back the memories that felt comfortable and like comfort care. You know, it was like just making them feel comfortable and like very at home because they decorated the place in a way that was familiar to them. A snoozeland room, it's a Dutch concept. So I'm saying I saw it in Holland and they brought it to America and Israel. So I've seen it in these places. It could be they're using it in other places in the world as well. Snoozeland means to sniff and to doze. And it's a multi-sensory room that helps calm agitated dementia patients. They use it here in Israel also with children with developmental delays and cognitive impairments and all sorts of uh, disabilities. This is a multi-sensory approach to calming that's why I didn't want to call it a therapy because in therapy, like there's like expectations from the client. There's no expectations. When I would sit in the snoozing room with someone, there were no expectations. I would just sit there quietly and just be with them and just allow them to calm down. Other than that, what I'm doing is pretty progressive, like working with the anti-aging and the memory improvement and the preventing dementia is pretty, pretty progressive. So thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to meet you, Rena. It was really amazing to have you on the Sniff Spotlight. My pleasure. Thank you. How does you. someone reach out to you and connect with you? Okay, so the best place is my website. It's my name, renayukowski.com, R-E-N-A-Y-U-D-K-O-W-S-K-Y, renayukowski.com. On there, you can book a free phone consultation with me. You can check out whatever I have going on, whether I'm teaching my course or my re-membership program. I have a three-month membership program called Remembership. Pretty much you can find everything I do. You can watch some of my videos and webinars on my website. RenaYukowski.com. If you're on Facebook, I have a Facebook group for, with seniors from all over the world. And I post every day in there memory tips and fun stuff on aging, humor. You can follow me and ask me questions that way as well. And you can email me if anyone has any questions about memory or dementia or memory improvement courses. I just email me, Rena at RenaYukowski.com. Amazing, Rena. Thank you so much. It was really an honor. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing this tremendously important part of senior care. The Sniff Spotlight series highlights healthcare heroes and thought leaders in the skilled nursing community. We're building awareness, trust, and shining the light on sniffs. So stay tuned. Remember to like, comment, and share.